and there are certain tools that we've used that have helped keep us on the right side. Now, we're very selective. We don't like to trade uh, like high frequency. We like to look for high probability, low risk setups, and we do get and come across a lot of trades in that capacity. And I will describe to you exactly the tools we use and how you can apply them in your own trading. So with that said, I, may I just uh, take a moment here to uh, display this uh, disclaimer, which is important as I'm still registered with the CFTC and the role in the NFA as a CTA. So with that said, what we're looking for to help traders solve some problems is just number one, I always thought, um, as I was taught, and, and many of you might be familiar with, I see someone posted a question about trying to set up stochastics. Um, you know, I learned from the guy who created it, George Lane. So Jim uh, Rezek, you're asking uh, this, uh, this afternoon, you're trying to set up a stochastics, do you know which one you guys use? Well, I use a fast stochastics, but I, I don't need anything slower than um, a, 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 an older indicator. And, and I use other indicators as well. And I think that depending on the market of what you're trading, there are are uh, better momentum indicators, and that's a price-based indicator. It's not a condition-based indicator. Condition means what the participation is by virtue of volume. And I know a lot of people from our various uh, presentations and, and in-person seminars, a lot of people have really been struggling using the volume histogram in recent uh, years. And there is a solution for that, and it's uh, an indicator that was created some uh, gosh, 30 plus years ago by a, a man by the name of Joe Granville who passed away last year. Um, any event, we'll talk about that because it's one of the technical tools we use. So I always believe that if you have better analytical skills, your trading is going to improve. I mean, it's real simple. I mean, uh, it, it, it doesn't get any more cut and dry than that. I think for an options trader, and many of you are thinkorswim clients like myself, um, you know, you always hear about people adjusting their option position. That's a very polite way of saying you're in a losing trade, now you've got to trade your way out of it. That's really what it, it boils down to. Um, most of you know that I started trading um, options on the sh uh, 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 via the first commodity that was ever introduced to was on treasury bonds back in 1984. So I've had a, a very uh, wide and long experience with trading every kind of option strategy there is, including the... Uh, Back in the 90s, people were really hot and heavy on the uh, delta neutral strategies, which in directional trading environment does not work too well. Or in a directional trade, for you know, people would uh, all of a sudden found out that iron condors isn't quite the greatest uh, uh, trade. Or in corrections, um, you know, covered call writing doesn't quite thoroughly protect you like maybe a collar strategy will. So I guess. The, the moral of the story is if you have better analytical skills then, and you understand market conditions, then you'll be able to apply certain strategies. Like one of my theories, folks, for you option traders out there, um, you know, we look at trying to, to sell premium in a high implied volatility environment. Well, unfortunately, this past year, we've had a low implied volatility environment compared to historic or 52-week past uh, historic volatility. And, and one of the things I, I, I generally teach to people is sometimes you've got to give up those option theories for market conditions. So for example, we see V bottoms as the stock market just proved, and we see rounding tops as the mar stock market just proved this past year. It was more of a, a rounding top, a, a broadening top as we correctly tweeted out. That was another really nice tweet that I hope some of you uh, benefited from that, number one, if you're in a market condition that's in a topping process, why would you be in a condor? If it tops out, wouldn't just be uh, looking at the market to stop the advance? Wouldn't a credit call spread work? If it is a low implied volatility market, granted, you won't get maybe the best prices, but you'd be in the right strategy. And that's the key, I think, that if we can help you um, uncover some of the tools of, that we have that are exclusive to each and every market, I think you'll, you'll have a better um, chance of success in picking out the, not just the right strategies, but also the right trade. So there are certain technical tools, and we'll get into that tonight real quick. Risk management is always key. You know, people sell premium and get into 
um, which I never understood why people like in this environment of earnings, which we've just passed pretty much the majority of earnings season is behind us. Um, in the last eight reporting, two years now, in the last two years, we've had what we call a binary event, really. I mean, you have to guess whether a stock's going to beat um, the top, the bottom line. Is the stock going to go up or down? And is the stock going to go up or down by 3% or 20%? So it's been pretty wild. And there are some tools, and I believe that there's always someone in the know. There's always someone in the know in the stock market. Someone always knows. And I think there's this tool that can help us uncover the overall trend of that in the know type of positioning. So I'm going to talk about that tonight because we've had some, some general success there. Um, I'm always very leery of, and I want to seem like bragging because, you know, the markets will humble you really, really quickly. And uh, that's, that's the thing, knock on wood, that, you know, we just want to make sure that if you are right in the market, you're properly positioned. And that's what the this this third uh, number bullet point is about risk management. Whenever you're wrong, you're always in one, you know, or whenever you're right, you're always in one, and whenever you're wrong, you're always in a hundred. You know, that's the old floor traders adage. You know, people don't get properly positioned for a market. Like, they don't trust their indicators, so when they're right, they're only in a couple, and, you know, when they have that great gut feeling like they can't lose, they just load the boat, and that's the one that gives you the, you know, that crushing blow. So I think if we can learn, we need to learn to be a little bit more systematic in the sizing of our positions, and we need to be a little bit more disciplined in waiting for the right setups. So I think that's what can help people is the ability to anticipate some market opportunities. And is there a way to do that successfully? And, and I believe that the tools that I'm going to share with you tonight are absolutely dynamic. They've been working, and I don't have any reason to believe that they won't continue to work um, in, the, in the years to come. So I, I think if you have a better understanding of the derivative markets, like options and, and on stocks and equities, then you might be able to apply more and better option strategies. And that's the key here uh, for all traders. So the tools I use, just to cut to the chase, are the ones that uh, a few of that I created. First off, the PPS um, buy and sell indicators, which is available on multiple platforms, including TOS, of course, TradeStation, Genesis, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I also use uh, my candle patterns that I've written about over a decade ago, the high close and low close doji. They're easy to spot, plus they're easy to scan on various computer trading softwares. Of course, I use person's pivots to define trend and to determine support and resistance in most time frames. When I define most time frames, it can be the dailies, the weekly, the monthly, the option expiration instead of a calendar month, and of course, for longer term, is the quarterly pivots. And we've got a lot of stuff, a lot of markets that are near quarterly pivot resistance right now, by the way. And there's, there's, I think, some, some pretty intriguing, eye-opening information uh, for everyone in tonight's presentation. Um, I use chart patterns. Many of you have seen, uh, we did a presentation here well over two, about a month and a half ago. And I was telling everyone about a broadening, the correct term was a broadening top. And a, a foghorn is another way of calling them. And someone said, well, they've heard it called a megaphone before. And uh, obviously, that was a, a, a very succinct and correct market identification because it's exactly what that pattern was. So wedges and channels are very important in our work, and I think people need to understand how to trade those. Seasonal and cycle analysis is a big component of what I use, since uh, many of you know I am the co-author of the Commodity Traders Almanac for many years. Um, I do look at volume, but instead of volume histogram, I use the on balance volume indicator. I also have a histogram. It's a momentum indicator. It's exclusive to TradeStation. I use relative strength analysis. Some of you are familiar with the term pairs trading or a spread trade. And we look at spreads like the knob spread, notes over bonds, the crush spread, which has to do with soybeans versus soy meal and bean oil, the crack spread. The crack spread is simply looking at crude oil in its relationship to reformulated blend gasoline and heating oil. 
Um, and of course, for almost every single market, I look at the commitment of traders data for uh, looking at, of course, it's exclusive to futures, but it applies to foreign currencies, it, it applies to stock indices, and it applies to the bond market. And most importantly, for looking at stock and stock indices, one of the most exclusive bits of data that's out there is breadth analysis, which, of course, many of you have heard about using advanced decline information. So that seems like a lot, but you know, some of the things that if we're, we're investing money, um, you know, chart patterns has to do with continuations, breadth analysis has to do with the condition of the market, volume has to do with the participation rate as well as breadth analysis, and, and, and of course the commitment of traders data, there's no better contrarian indicator than looking at someone and asking their opinion of what they think of the market when that person has money in the market. You know, asking someone off the street what they think of the stock market when they don't have any skin in the game isn't really relevant to me. But asking someone who's put money down, whether it's a put, a call, actual futures position on, that person has skin in the game, and that's worthy of checking out. So I think the, the first thing I wanted to share with you, because it's very relevant where we're at right now in the market, uh, we've seen a very dynamic move, and I think we, it, it behooves us to take a look at this commitment of traders data. It can be found on our website, and just uh, uh, to share with you real quick, if we go over to uh, my home page, if you go visit Persons Planet, and I'll get this up in just a minute. Somehow I went somewhere else and didn't want to do that, so here we go. So if you go to Persons Planet, the main home page, and you go right under Tools, first thing you see is COT data. You click on that, you click Get Report, and uh, the uh, web page will populate. And um, that'll, uh, while it's thinking about populating right here, We'll come back to that, but it's under trading tools of our website. Now, I want you to look at a couple things here because uh, this is interesting. It's very important. Back in March of 2010, note that we had an open interest reading of 3,784,040 contracts. That's the amount of open positions, net long or net short. Well, back in the day, note that the non-reportable positions, that's the small speculator category. You got the non-commercial hedge fund, the commercials, which are the hedgers, and then the speculators, the non-reportable position. They were short the market. Um, you know, it doesn't look like they're really short, right? 427 long versus 591 short. Well, basically, what we like to look at instead of looking at these actual figures, because these actual figures can be kind of misinterpreted. But what can't be misinterpreted is what's the actual open figure tab and what is the actual percent of open interest for each category. So this actual time frame shows that the small speculators were short the market. They held 15%, which is a huge, huge number. Um, and the commercials were actually, look at this, 66.8 and 66.9. They were neutral. They weren't really long one way or another. The commercials weren't really in it. So if you had a bet between professional uh, hedge fund traders and the small speculator, who would you put your money on that's going to be right? The small speculator, the one lot trader that's maybe not as disciplined, doesn't wait for setups, you know, is just trading maybe on the seat of their pants, or the maybe professional trader, the hedge fund trader, or maybe a floor trader uh, who's doing this for a living. Um, my money goes with the professional traders versus the general public all day long. Now, I'm not here to tell you that every hedge fund trader is right, trust me. But I think when it's a, 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 a situation where the commercials are neutral and it's a, a battle between the hedge funds and the general public, the hedge funds will probably win 80% of the time. Now, they actually held about 18% of the net long positions. This is that same time, March. 2010, and you, as you can see, the speculators probably were betting that the stock market couldn't go any higher, and they were short, 
and they were short a significant position. So the funds were long and the small specs were short. Now this picture I use almost at every single conference and every single seminar I ever give because a picture speaks a thousand words. The yellow histogram at the bottom reflects the small speculator. The red is the commercials and the blue is the hedge funds. If you guys have been to one of my presentations before, then you've seen this time and time again, but it, it's worth noting that the small speculators were long from 07, literally at the V high in 2007, and they remained long and buying the brakes all the way down. Now, they thought that back here, right in this area that the market couldn't go any lower and as you note here they loaded the boat up at a really net long position if you see right here I mean it's one of the highest net large long positions that held by the small speculator and um, as you know the market continued to move down at the exact low of March of 2009 they went from the largest net long to one of the largest net short positions at the exact low. The hedge funds, it, it's like a mirror of an opposite position. They were short the market, and they were actually starting to build a long position by scaling in and managing their trade. And they ended up getting one of the net largest long positions on the lows. So they didn't get the low, but they probably got the best average price by scaling in. And as the market started to move up, they started to liquidate some of their longs and then hold a manageable position. That's what this, this data reflects here. The small speculator continued to fight the trend. They continued to be short the market. And this is why it's a zero line histogram. It reflects and reveals above the zero line is a net long, below the zero line is a net short position. So I mean, if you look through the history of the small speculator, uh, you know, they don't often get it right. So here's an interesting component back in September, and I'm not talking of 1934, I'm talking just a few weeks back, September 16th, week ending September 16th, look at the open interest, 4,361,270. Now we gave this presentation this exact slide at our seminar that we did down here at Singer Island a few weeks back, it was kind of uh, really revealing for people because it, it was it, it reflected. Look at the difference: five hundred and seventeen thousand versus three hundred and four thousand. They were actually net long two over two hundred thousand contracts. The um, open interest percent to open interest was nearly twelve percent, and that's the danger sign. Um, note that the commercials. They were almost neutral, and the hedge funds, they were actually more short just by a tad. But it was the general public. If you bet against the general public, more times than not, you're going to be right. So when the general public is super long the market, and you have other tools that say it might go down, it, leads, it leads you to the, the, the belief that if they get stopped out, they're going to have sell orders and that they may liquidate. And so um, being really long at the top of the market with a long, heavy net long position is another good bit of information to understand that there's ammunition for when the market goes down, these people may run out of money and get a margin call and have to liquidate. And if you're long and you get liquidated, it's selling. And this sell pressure is going to cause the market to go down. So that's how we say, is there ammunition for this market to go down? Do they have a large, long position? And the commitment of traders data revealed, yes, in fact, they did. So the COT data did help us to pinpoint uh, the September top in the market. Um, and, and as you can see, this is yellow, the large net long position here. The commercials were just short, and the hedge funds were barely in the trade. It was all being held up, this stock market up here at these highs, by the small speculator. Not a good formula. So another thing is we just did, uh, as we do uh, every week, and we tweeted this out as well, soybeans. And I know a lot of you people probably don't trade soybeans, but many of you may trade like John Deere and Monsanto and Archer Daniels Midland and a lot of these 
highly correlated stocks in the ag sector um, that 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 are very correlated to the price of the swings in, in, in the grain complex pricing. And so we always talk about the bottoms in the harvest lows. Now I understand that the you know we're getting close to November and you have that rollover that we start to look out going forward. But the funny thing is as the market was moving and soybeans were moving up, we, we revealed that, hey guys, you got a strong move with volume. My own personal momentum histogram was showing positive movement with this price action. And the commitment of traders showed that the small speculators had, believe it or not, this is one of the largest net short positions held by the public, and the hedge funds were neutral. In fact, they were barely short this market. It's almost the exact opposite of what we just saw with the um, E-mini S&Ps. So there is a rhyme and reason we do spot, and I do check with this information as part of the information that we send out to people and provide that, and we, we actually tweeted that out two weeks ago. Uh, and the market had one of the biggest uh, uh, one-week advances that we've seen in quite some time. The um, patterns that we talk about, on your chart here, you're looking at the daily chart of the S&Ps with, as you can see here, these uh, horizontal lines are the person's pivot levels. Back in um, September, we were uh, telling people, hey guys, this is, this is a very, in fact, we tweeted this uh, chart out, which can be found on Twitter. Um, we tweeted out that not only is this a broadening top, which is kind of like where you see higher highs and lower lows, right? Um, but it also came as the market made these higher highs in the stock market, the advanced decline analysis showed that the market was making lower highs. In other words, as the index was making newer highs, there wasn't a lot of participation or as much participation. So we have exclusive indicators that we can utilize that one, the commitment of traders reveals information of who's in charge of the market. And number two, we have indicators that can share with us rather than price indicators like a stochastics or a Williams percent R that people are very popular or big on, um, RSI, I mean those are all price based indicators and I, you know, we have other indicators that I find that are a little bit better uh, than those type of oscillators and, and in specific one would be the volume and this is an on balance volume indicator and as you can clearly see uh, the, if you look at this blue line, it's actually making lower highs. You guys see that lower high reading? So the price is making higher highs, and the blue line is making lower highs. So you had bearish divergence coming into the market from a volume perspective, and you had bearish divergence in market participation as, as the um, advanced decline analysis revealed. Here is um, a larger, as we said, okay, not only did we get a shorter term broadening top pattern, but we had a, a larger degree broadening top pattern. The market was making higher highs. It did make lower lows. If you think about this, this would have been the June low. The August low took out the June low, so that is a lower low, and these were higher highs. Now, when we extended this trend line out, it would extend out to the 185, especially that person's pivot target. Now, we all know the market went through that level by about a four-hour time period. It didn't last there very long. But the key is, if you can identify being able to uh, see that there's a potential top in the market and at least identify an area where the market could get to, it allows you to exit your trade. So if you were buying puts here, you would be able to cover those puts as we were. Now, what's interesting is moving forward, we had identified that the advanced decline, this is another thing we tweeted out, and many of you, I hope, benefited from this information, that number one, the volume indicator shot straight up here. We had a little bit of a, a what's called a, the PPS buy signal that generated, and it should have generated on every platform. The Russell was starting to outperform every single stock index on that October low. It did so as the relationship of volume is concerned, and it did so as it relates to the exclusive advanced decline analysis on the Russell. 
So we started to see a marked improvement in the amount of participation of people buying the Russell stocks on those lows. And uh, that was one of the things that I think was a, a really smart trade. Now, to prove what I just said, the Russell and this graph here is a simple relative strength line chart. And if you look at the top, it's color code, color corded or coordinated. Crude oil is brown, GLD, gold is red. The British pound is that blue. Euro currency is that Barney purple. The yen is gray. The bonds is that fuchsia color or bright pink. The Russell, the IWM is orange. The Dow is, I guess, royal blue. NASDAQ's black and S&P is green. So from the October low, I mean, at one point, the Russell was down in this time period over, as you can see, 10%. And it's rallied up to today's area. Uh, it's had, a, as you can see, from low to high, a 10% move. The NASDAQ has only had less than a 10% move as of the S&Ps. But the funny thing is the bond market, in with the, the Fed not reducing quantitative easing or reducing quantitative easing and not you know increasing that QE program the bond market hasn't really moved anyway what we take out of this information is that if we're looking to see one sector outperform we want to start to see it really excel and outpace the other markets and that's what as you can see as this is making new higher highs it took out the, the September highs if you follow the orange trend if you follow that orange trend you can clearly see that it was taking out and outperforming the other markets so there are some tools that we use and I like to see everyone um, maybe expand on looking at the on balance volume as we do in fact there's a couple things Q logic when their earnings came out remember when I just said that you know, it's kind of interesting where I think people are in the know. If you look at this chart, this is the, the chart at top is a daily chart. The chart on your bottom is a weekly chart. So if you have two different time frames, you can get a better grasp of, of the, the dynamics of the price and volume analysis. The interesting component here is as the market's starting to show this little basing action here, Look at the volume. You know, here you are making lows the prior week, and look at the volume on a weekly basis. I mean, the October price low, the July and August price lows, but the volume was nowhere near that. So that wasn't showing that there was significant selling pressure. On the contrary, it was showing there was an accumulation. Somebody was in the know on Q Logic that this was going to be a good earnings reporting season. Look at the daily chart. If I lied to each and every one or tricked you and I said, hey, this yellow line is a price line. At this point in time in October, you can clearly see the yellow line making what? Higher highs and higher lows. As you can see, the reality is that's a volume indicator. Looking at the price, it's not making higher highs. It's not making significant higher lows. But that volume indicator was revealing somebody was accumulating position. And of course, as you know, what happened is QLogic came out and said, well, you know, we've got a, a stock buyback program and we beat earnings on top of it all. Um, by the way, we did tweet, we took this trade in our trading room and we actually tweeted that out to the general public here. So about exactly just that same analysis. So the volume histogram was showing bullish accumulation by looking at that green line making those higher highs. But it was truly the volume level that was just outstanding. Now, many of you you may have remembered this is a we were joking about this in the trading room it's like JDS Uniphase my god I even forgot what that company does right I mean it was a blast from the past it's like listening to what maybe Red Hat or you know all these other high-flying tech names back in 2000 were all about right but again it notice that it has the very similar components in the weekly daily analysis the weekly chart was not, as this market was just like kind of moving sideways, the weekly chart was making higher lows and higher highs. Look at the daily chart. 
If I told you that this chart uh, back in the middle of October when the world was crashing and I said, hey, this yellow line is going up, I think we should buy it. And if I told you that yellow line was price, you'd probably say, yeah, it looks pretty good that, you know, your market's moving up and it's compared to the S&P 500, it's not crashing. But then when you look at the price action, you go, I don't know what to make of this. So sometimes the volume analysis, and that's why they say volume precedes price, the volume analysis can help us uncover maybe the, the true market participation's view of that that underlying market. So in essence, somebody, in my opinion, knew that JDS Uniphase was going to not only beat, but give an opportunity. When we looked at options and we were going through our option chain, we noticed that there was some huge open interest and huge volume, not in the weekly options, not on the November options, but out in the January options. And so we actually picked up a stock replacement strategy and did the $12 in the money calls um, for that setup and that trade. Now, I'd like to also say, what are we doing in the current market? Because that's kind of like stuff that we have done. What's going forward? Well, the first thing, I want to look at Apple because I'm a little bit concerned here. Uh, Apple is near uh, the red line at the bottom of your chart is a weekly chart on Apple. It's near quarterly pivot resistance. Um, and the funny thing is that this market has had a really nice breakout making higher highs. That's why it's circled here on the bottom chart. But note that the volume is not conforming with that price. It's not showing there is substantial momentum and, and participation behind the stock. So, well, okay, well, maybe it's because the week just started and maybe it's a, a delayed reaction. What does the daily charts look like? And that's why we do look at both the daily and the weekly. And interestingly enough, since the September high in Apple, you know, it had this little sell-off and it, 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 as you note, has had this amazing little breakout to the upside. My histogram is showing lower highs and the volume analysis is showing lower highs. And so Apple is actually at a, uh, uh, a crossroads of where it is not really moving up on significant volume on both the daily and the weekly. So I'm a little concerned there. And I think that at the very least, we'll go from a period of a strong trend without great volume participation, that the advance should stall and peter out and maybe come back into more of its uh, in-depth, longer term, the trading range that it's been for the last few weeks. So to me, I'm not saying that Apple's going to crash and burn and, and, and go to zero. What I'm saying is that the acceleration of the pace of the price change be, uh, due to the lack of volume of participation here uh, is giving this a great credit call spread strategy, even despite its low IV environment. It's again, the market condition warrants a particular risk-defying strategy. Now, here's an interesting one for you stock traders, Yahoo. Yahoo has a similar type of situation, which is really perplexing because I understand they have that exposure with uh, Alibaba. Everyone knows that. But boy, take a look at this uh, stock as the momentum green indicator here, it's making lower highs. The higher this stock goes, the lower the green readings are. In fact, the higher this stock has broken out on a daily chart, I'm scratching my head going, well, why aren't people really getting behind this stock and buying this thing? Maybe it's another what we call delayed reaction. So I look at my weekly charts and I go, oh my goodness, this thing has just moved up on air. There's no major volume participation as it relates to this stock. I mean, so if this market was to peter out, if the advance was to stall, it is the lack of volume and the lack of market buying that's brought this market up. That's one of the things that I think is uh, a, a very a market that's very susceptible for pullbacks. So those two markets right there with those two conditions, I wanted to, to leave you with that. So a couple things that as I mentioned earlier, where are we with our, our seasonal analysis? And, and so I'd say, well, this is like the best time of the year to buy stocks, most people feel, right? So here's the S&P 500, the life of history of the market. And the funny thing is we do get Octobers 
um, that you see the market uh, gets those little uh, great buying opportunities and then and we rally going into traditionally the first week of November which is right now and after the first week of November sometimes the market on average the market actually goes down into the third week Thanksgiving so with an election coming out tomorrow unemployment report out on Friday and a really strong accelerated stock market in price I'd ask myself from a seasonal perspective is the market due for a pullback and does the S&P 500 traditionally see a pullback this time of year and the answer sitting in front of you is absolutely yes so with that said I go well what other tool would we want to look at right and and so let's take a gander real quick I'm going to share this with you I, I wasn't going to get off subject here but I wanted to go through and just share with you a couple things here this is the S&P 500 now this is the pink is the advanced decline for the S&P 500 that I've constructed it's just it's the top the 500 stocks in the S&P and this is just the advanced decline most people get breadth analysis based on the NYSE well I construct an advanced decline on all the top indexes the graph in the middle this is the on balance volume indicator and what's really perplexing is that this huge recovery rally that's taken us all the way up here that's at our as you can see the interesting aspect is this is actually our quarterly uh, pivot or monthly pivot excuse me um, and and we are right at that that little target resistance uh, the funny thing is there is no volume on this rally so I'm a little concerned about you know we have a gap down below from Thursday to Friday and we probably need to digest this little move here um, so that's the S&P 500 maybe maybe I'm wrong maybe there's volume that came into the Nasdaq after all the Nasdaq broke out and made new highs on the year I'm sure that had strong volume so I look at that and I go well the advanced decline looks pretty strong because it broke out and made new highs that's down here but this on balance volume indicator once again it doesn't really reveal or reflect strong volume or participation so what that suggests is the prices are a little overstretched and possibly we could see a pullback to at least fill the gap and chop and slop around as we have done on many times after breakouts in the marketplace so maybe all the money went into the diamonds let's check out the diamonds the Dow Jones Industrial Average maybe everyone's still buying blue chips that are high dividend yielding payout stocks because that had a after all uh, one thing that we identified was that this market made that in case you didn't see in the cash market an island bottom so actually if you've never seen an abandoned baby or an island bottom the diamonds actually did make an island bottom which is a very bullish pattern and the market acted very bullishly the only thing I have to say is that you had a gap you had a potential midpoint gap you had another gap over here and now you had maybe potentially an exhaustion gap so I say well the market broke out to new highs in the Dow how was the volume on that maybe that's where all the volumes gone and I go oh man volumes really lagging here uh, boy that's kind of a that to me is a shocker we did have all the stocks in the in the Dow it, it, the uh, advanced decline as it relates to the Dow Jones Industrial Average it broke out and so it confirms that high but boy, I'll tell you what, it's a very suspicious breakout when there's no real volume behind that move. Maybe everything went in the Russell, as John was saying earlier. And yes, while as you see here, the Russell, the small cap sector, really did get more volume rate participation. It did get an advanced decline analysis going. Now, why the difference that this index brings is that it did not, while it did recover significantly, it, it just didn't break out and make newer highs. In fact, one of the things, if I just draw a little uh, chart here, I think you guys would probably see that I'm drawing a potential trading range. Maybe this market's at the top of a, a trading range, and maybe the market needs to come back and potentially fill that gap so uh, you know I'm not gonna play the uh, uh, and I'm, I'm just gonna cut to the chase here even looking at the 
NASDAQ composite index. Uh, the NASDAQ composite index saw good strength in volume, uh, but not in participation. So the advanced decline doesn't look good there. And then last but not least, this is the um, index that most everyone takes their advanced decline information from. Now, I've given this out before. I, I used to teach this exclusively to our group, but I, I think it behooves helping to educate you guys. When you look at the ARMS index, the tick, the trend, things of that nature, and when you look at all of the advanced decline, most trading platforms give you the advanced decline comparative ratio line. Unfortunately, they're only giving you the advanced decline ratio line typically on the NYSE, the New York Stock Exchange Composite Index. All right, so what's wrong with that? It's a broad-based stock index. Yes, but it's too broad-based in the sense that over 50% of the stocks contained within that index are interest rate sensitive preferred stocks as well as bond funds. So if bonds don't go down and bonds stay steady, as I shared with you earlier in the presentation, then you're not going to get a sense of a real big change in the advanced decline, and it could throw you off. So it is one that I watch, but I don't really trust as much uh, as it relates to comparing it to all the top six indexes that we're all trading. After all, the S&Ps is the benchmark uh, that every hedge fund's performance and mutual fund performance has to beat or meet. The Qs is the NASDAQ 100 that we're all following. The Dow Jones Industrial Average, everyone knows what that is. And of course, the Russell for growth stocks or small cap as they're referred, right? So we have all these things that we trade. And that's why it's important to look at these different stock indexes and look at the condition of the rally or the condition of the breakdown. Was there strong volume? Was there good participation within the stocks contained in that index? Now hopefully that makes a lot of logical sense. So right now I'm scratching my head. I'm like, well if you ever thought the market was overbought, you know, markets can get as much overbought until, you know, you can't finance that trade idea, right? But when we look at seasonal analysis and we say, well, the S&P 500, maybe this year is different. You know, maybe we're not going to have that little early November sell-off after a strong October rally. And I don't think, I think we will see that because of the information I've just supplied to you guys. So let's dig deeper and say, well, maybe the transportation is going to do well because crude oil is down, right? After all, crude oil has been you know, trying to break 80 bucks and Goldman Sachs said it's going to hit 75 and maybe we just saw John Person's scans on his live account at, at Thinkorswim show all these scans popped up with four hour uh, sell signals in, in a lot of energy stocks. So maybe that's good for transportations. Normally it would be, but the transportation sector, the IYT, which is an ETF you can measure, saw significant gains as well. And uh, truthfully, it's not the first week. It's about the middle of the month. It sees a decline going into the third week in November. So yes, it too, the transportations, it has a little delayed reaction. It doesn't happen in the first week of November. It happens towards the second week of November. So maybe as you start to see the stock market and the S&Ps roll over a little bit and you don't see the transportations, don't say, oh, it's, 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 it's not going to go down because transportations are outperforming. Remember, transportations have kind of a delayed reaction, so wait a couple days before you make that opinion that you think the transportation stocks are very strong, right? They actually have a delayed reaction, but they see traditionally a seasonal tendency to decline going into the third week of November. So there's the materials. Maybe the material sector is going to save us because John just said, uh, you know, some of the materials that are in the ag space like Mosaic and, and, and maybe uh, the Dow uh, with um, Dow Chemicals or Monsanto, which produces fertilizer, right, uh, which farmers have to, after harvest, they, 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 they till the fields and they prepare for the next planting season a little bit, right? So maybe, maybe we've got DuPont and some of these other names can help save the days of the materials. Well, the funny thing is they actually, in the first week, they also have a seasonal tendency to go down. So that's kind of, that's kind of a warning flag. Now I'm looking at, well, what about the industrials? And the industrials, the same thing. They have a tendency to see a little decline 
in the middle of November. So I'm looking at a lot of different stocks in, in various sectors that, like John Deere, of course, in the industrial, which is kind of like a ag and industrial and Caterpillar, the same kind of thing. Um, I'm looking at, at sectors here that can weigh in on the market. So I think if, if it may behoove us to watch the shorter term one hour, four hour time frames, and also with tomorrow's election, I'm not sure if it's going to be, you know, fully baked in that uh, now it seems that people are talking about uh, gridlock in Washington if we have a, you know, Republican sweep. I'm more concerned about the traditional seasonal tendency of the market and the lack of volume which made this market run up. Two things can happen. A, the market may pause here, not really go down, you know, significantly. But the market could pause here, at least the ascent can stall, till the market regroups. And then we, we see more volume come back into the game. And that might be a consideration. In the meantime, I think what we've noted is a lot of times you see the stock market run up during the US session and get sold off in the overnight session. And we see the opposite occur. And I think up here, as we approach the S&P's 1220, 1225 handle, with the gap that exists down below, an unemployment number out on Friday, I think the market could stall here, providing us with uh, some credit call strategies, especially in stocks that have accelerated to the upside, that are entering maybe a seasonally weak period of time. And so therefore, we might have some really good you know, theta time decay as we head into the November option expiration. As well, I think we might have some really good day trade setups as if the market's slightly overbought, we're going to have two-sided trading. So that's going to offer some exciting day trades in the few days to come and in the week ahead, especially with, of course, the monthly, as we joke around and say, the monthly unenjoyment report. So this is the e-mini S&P chart currently. I wanted to share this with you because all of a sudden, I want you to note that on this rally here, the general public is doing a bang-up job by getting long again. Um, this is as of Friday's data. Today's Monday. So as of last Tuesday, when they collect this data, it's released on Friday. I want you to note that the small speculators back in on the long side of the market. And uh, the momentum indicator works two ways. It gives us divergence patterns, and it gives us overbought, like the McClellan oscillator, when it reaches two over... Uh, you know, a, a, a too high of a number. And as you can see, this green line is at the highest level it's been in two years. So the momentum to the upside, uh, the fact that we're at a pivot resistance, add up to the fact that we have a seasonal time period this week that we enter in a, a little two-week sell-off or two-week seasonal weakness, combine the fact that the small specs now convincingly long in the market, I would say that Perhaps at the very least, I'm not going to tell you the market's going to crash and burn, but I'll say I think uh, it behooves us to look at a defined risk strategy that we could see the market at least stall the ascent or higher price movement. It, it, it makes it a, a really compelling, a lot of evidence that suggests maybe we should now start to look at you know, uh, um, selling rallies for day traders and also look at maybe some credit call spreads in some very significantly overbought uh, stocks, especially the one like Apple and Yahoo that are near mer very important pivot resistance. So I wanted to share with you how do we come up with some of the trade ideas um, and it's simply putting a lot of uh, confirming non-correlated indicators because after all, the commitment of traders this commitment of traders has got nothing to do with on balance volume. The histogram has nothing to do with either one of these other indicators. And of course, person's pivots on these time frames have nothing to do with any of the other indicators. So we're using multiple and seasonal analysis combines multiple life of history of data and price trends of the market. So if we're looking for a trade idea, I think you know when we get this information, we can develop a trading plan, and we can start to explore what type of risk do I need. And if I'm going to put money down and, and risk my capital, 
uh, what's the probability of success? What type of tools out there? And do those tools have a relevancy? And do those tools have a history of working well? You know, not all the time is every single trade going to work out for us. But if we line our ducks up, if the stars are kind of lining up, we have a higher chance of success. And then if we have a strategy, then if the trade has merits, we're going to be rewarded. And I think that's the message and the methodology that we try to put together. Let's put together a game plan that, you know, now you have to just sit down and say, okay, what is my working capital? What do I want to do? Do I want a day trade? Do I want a swing trade? Do I have money to devote to maybe a weekly trade? Something of that nature. And, and then you can kind of formulate using this information is applicable for every type of trader out there. So, I mean, so that you can experience my methodology, I definitely, you more than likely receive my weekly observations. If not, they're posted on the website. We email that to our database, to our clients. Um, in fact, on the website, just decided to come back up again. Nice. Um, thanks, thanks, Mr. Um, uh, Internet Browser. The, uh, the, the, the tools that I was sharing with you before, the Commitment of Traders, is right on the tool. There it is. Um, if you don't know how to use that, you can go down to this next uh, link. It's called Instructional Videos. We've really posted in almost all the instructional videos, whether you want to learn about TradeStation, whether you want to learn about how to use my indicators with Thinkorswim, um, all of this information, Trade Navigator, uh, are past in this particular in a couple days. But if you go over here to the blog, interesting here, the, the interesting aspect here is we, you can go back and see all the, you know, I think we have older posts that you can look and say, well, what was this guy saying a month ago, three weeks ago in September? Was he talking about buying puts and preparing for the eventual decline? Was he practicing what he, he preaches? And, and you can go see and, and, and take some time going through that. Um, so many of you have probably seen that information, and it's pretty applicable. I try to put that out for, for our trading community as well as myself. I, I tweet the trade ideas with exits and entries. And of course, on our website, we have formal educational modules. Uh, we have trading courses and books. And you know I conduct live seminars. Um, and of course, I host a virtual trading room daily from 9 AM to 12 PM Eastern Standard Time each and every day. So if you would like to uh, experience the methodology and hang with us for a couple days, we look for day trade setups, we look for stock trades, and I look for stock option trades. So depending on your, you know, we like to view ourselves as active traders. We have several professional traders in the room. Um, and, and we typically have opened our doors and have open houses. Um, we've been more active, obviously, in stocks since we We've seen some incredible moves here. So if you would like to join us for the next two days, uh, Tuesday and Wednesday, I'm opening the doors for you to, to our trading community um, and, and uh, for the next two days just to experience what we do. And if you're interested, then you can come back and find out more about us. So that concludes tonight's session. I wanted to cover the fact that, yes, while we do have uh, a really nice, amazing upside market, and we do have good market participation rate. We have some gaps in the charts that I'm a little concerned about. We have a lack of volume participation, which I'm a little concerned about. And we have a seasonal event that typically we see market declines in the S&Ps, and then we see secondary markets and sectors decline a few days later that may add to or accelerate an S&P decline into the third week of November. So what is traditionally the third week in November? Thanksgiving. So traditionally, if the market sells off and people kind of get all panicky and all of a sudden you go to Thanksgiving and you got the day after Black Friday, it's considered, right? And then you got Cyber Monday. And so maybe that's, that's where you get that regeneration of upside. People that may have missed the move in this stock market, they're waiting for a pullback and you know professional traders can wait for you know they they've got time to be positioned before year's end they do have time i think the difference between a professional trader and and uh the the individual trader is the the the, the ability to have some patience and the discipline to practice that patience 
So that does conclude today's session. Um, we unbelievable concluded right on time, and I want to say uh, thank you all for being here and joining us. And if you uh, are certainly interested in, uh, if you you have an interest in coming back and, and spending a couple days with us, then have the same login information, and we'll see you here tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. The same link, the same password, everything's the same. And I want to say thank you all for joining us. All right, so I just stopped the uh, recorder, and if you guys want to revisit that, we'll uh, have that uh, link sent out to you guys. Thank you all very much, and uh, if you're here with us tomorrow, fantastic. Otherwise, we will have that recorded. Obviously, there's a wealth of information that you can find, and uh, some of the uh, information uh, on the website, especially those tweets. Uh, you know, it's a good way to communicate, I found, with people, especially when we talk about things in the morning in the trading room, like trading idea. And uh, so people can't be in the room all day long. And then what we do is we tweet, hey, guys, we see this. Or, you know, day trades are, uh, you know, they're hard to, to uh, tweet out. We find uh, I've, I've, I have tweeted out uh, specific sell signals and tweets there. But, you know, by the time people get the tweet, they look at it and they go to act, you know, it's off the market. But at least you get alerted uh, a little bit to some of the things that we had talked about in the trading room. So, um I wish everyone a great evening, and uh, tomorrow's election day, um, as they say in Chicago, vote, vote early and vote often, and uh, I'll see everyone tomorrow. Take care. Thank you.